Hello. Hello, Helena. This is Max. Good morning, Max. How are you? I'm a little slower than I want to be, but that's not new. <laughs> <laughs> we can make it through. We will fight and we will be strong. Yes, and we do. We, I, I, when I witness my own capacity to do that, when I, when I watch you doing it, when I watch others doing it, it reminds me that it's even possible to be this strong. I did strong. not know before that it was possible for people to be this strong in situations <laughs> like these. I have notes from you about what we want to talk about today. And although I, I haven't been able to sit with them very long, I noticed some familiar names. Um, maybe I, I'll, bring, I'll bring up some of those later, right before our conversations, every time we talk. One of the things that happens for me is that because because our conversations about this tend to be really hard conversations, a lot of the things we've had to talk about in our previous recordings have been conversations that people don't know how to have. They don't know how to participate in those conversations. And for me, right before I talk to you, uh -huh. I feel this really activated life energy about all of the really challenging intersections that we deal with every day, where there's something that comes through when I talk with you. There's something that comes through in your voice and in the way that you're approaching these conversations that is really deeply loving and really um, nourishment stabilizing. And that it it's very it's very hard for me to describe. It's very complex for me because I'm con I'm connected to all of these really different conversations in really different languaging that are about the hardest conversations we could possibly be having. But in the yeah. midst of that is how much we care for one another that we want to have these conversations. Yes, yes, that's true. I think my nourishing approach comes from being a mother and being a nurse also, and being a true nurse, you know, to always stand behind my patients. Yeah. And being compassionate and as a human being, it's very important. And that's part of what we we tune into as much as we can when we are getting to know one another in the network. What is it about one another? What is it about the lives that we've lived and the experiences we've had that allow us to care about one another? And when we were starting to talk about your daughter's life, about Bianca's life, um, before these truly unfortunate events occurred, those are not, I got, I want to use better words. Truly unfortunate is such a mild way of, of saying like the experiences that you've had and that many people are having now, when we recognize the life energy that we're all bringing as ourselves into the world. And then for our community members who have lost their lives, what is it about what they brought into the world that has informed our ability to fight for them and for one another. That's where this conversation lives for me after our previous conversation. So I, I sort of wanted to start there and then see where you wanted to take it. Today, I would like to talk more about Bianca Tlais. Uh, so people get to know her because so, so far, I feel I was talking about a patient. I was labeling her as a patient. Mm, yeah. And she was not just a patient, she was somebody. And the, the people who will listen to those uh, previous uh, recordings, they will see her just as a patient, as a one of the million. But she was different. And uh, I was never talking about her personal life that much because Bianca was always very humble. <laughs> Since she was the small child, she was always very humble. So I wanted to kind of touch on her life. Bianca was born in Windsor, in Canada, in Ontario, in 1981. And she was a Libra sign, whatever that meant in her life. I don't know. Mm. Which had a life which was kind of short, you know? Yeah. And uh, so... Uh, 
uh, me and my ex-husband, we are both of Bohemian background. Uh, people do not know what Bohemian means. Um, we call it Czech, but actually the Bohemians were one of the Celtic tribes, which uh, ended up in that area many, many years ago. Yeah. And then they mix with the Slavic people. <laughs> so mm-hmm. people don't know, people think that Bohemian means the lifestyle. It's not the lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe it is lifestyle here, but it's not the lifestyle in that area. It's the, actually, it was one of the Celtic tribes. And so uh, in my family, we also have some German and Hungarian background. Um, my grandfather also, who's a very travel man from my mother's side, he lived uh, many years in Argentina. And so maybe that's where Bianca got her traveling attitude. <laughs> and from her parents also, because um, I have met my ex-husband on Cyprus. And we have lived about um, one year in Greece, and then we moved to Canada. Bianca was the only child we had together. Uh, my marriage failed, and uh, it may be within five years, and I was become I be, had become a single parent, and I was raising Bianca my, by myself. But uh, her dad was always there. I would never stop the relationship between them because I feel that it's the very important that the daughter has a, a relationship with her father yeah. too. That's very important. And for for uh, a child has to have a relationship, no matter if the marriage fails. Um, there has to be always um, access for both parents to have uh, access to the child. They have to keep the relationship very close. That's uh, that's a very important aspect for any ch- ch- child when they grow up. Yeah. So Bianca, she did lots of good stuff with her father. They used to travel and um, they were both downhill skiers, so very avid downhill skiers. I used to do that many years ago. I, I stopped, so I was not good for her at this aspect. I came so close to try it. I wanted to. I wanted to learn downhill skiing and I came really close to trying before I got really sick. And then it, it, it became a lot harder to even imagine doing, but it, Yes, it's neat to talk about it with other people. Thank you for mentioning it. I gave up on that because I said, I don't want to fracture anything when I have to be a single mother yeah. taking care of my child. I have to become a responsible adult. I cannot do whatever I would want it to do. And they also used to spend holidays together. You know, um, my ex-husband, he very married after and he has other children, but they used to spend holidays together. So Bianca entered the grade school in Windsor in Ontario. She went into Catholic school and then we relocated to Key West, Florida. And she continued her uh, her uh, grade school education level. And at that point, uh, when she was in the grade school in Canada, uh, they had some presentation and they had to do like a fashion show. And that was her fa- first fashion show ever. <laughs> in what grade was she in? She was like in a grade maybe six, seven, you know. Oh, in seventh grade. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they go in those grades and uh, middle school, you know, how they call those, um, that level. And uh, so they had to do some presentation. So that was Bianca's first fashion show. <laughs> it was not the modeling later on in the year. It was actually her first fashion show. <laughs> and, I wonder if you have any any pictures or video or anything from that time. I'm trying to figure out what year, because I was born in 1981. Um, so oh. when I was in sixth or seventh grade, I'm trying to remember what year that would have been, 1987, 1980. I'm not sure. I'm doing the math wrong. Um, my math brain isn't working right now. But um, I think about pictures that I had from sixth grade or seventh grade. Uh-huh. And, and they really, they y- you can have really, really meaningful pictures from that time in your life. So that being the first fashion show, that's... You know, that picture still exists somewhere. I know it exists. I mm-hmm. would have to start looking for it. I know I have that picture somewhere. I think she did that show with her girlfriend and they were just wearing those fleece pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny. She did not, at that point, she did not even know that she will be walking the runway. 
in mm-hmm. Milan. Wow. But wow. I did not know that. Yeah. You know, it was just done for fun, you know. So then uh, when we moved to Key West, um, Bianca finished the grade school and she entered the Key West High School. I was very pleased with Key West High School. Key West High School was so great for children. They had so many uh, clubs for children. You know, Bianca was in the French club and mm-hmm. cooking club. And the kids were so close and they were well protected, you know, um, against uh, drugs or anything like that. You know, they mm-hmm. would have uh, police coming every week with the dogs, everything. It was so well done. That schooling there was fabulous. And um, so, and then Bianca, when she was in the, uh, that was first year of high school, second year of high school, um, Bianca comes home one day and um, she tells me, you know, there is a girl named Christina in my class and she's a model. I said, really? (laughs) (laughs) And Christina truly was the model. She was in some of those, um, she was a commercial model and I think she was working through next agency in Miami and doing some commercial stuff. So I believe Bianca. So, so after uh, going back to the schooling, um, after the second year, um, I will touch the modeling, how it went later on. Um, we had to move to New York because of her contracts after the second year of her high school. And um, then Bianca completed her high school with uh, professional children's school on the Upper West Side here in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And she graduated with the honor roll. She was like a second. There was some boy who was uh, before her. And actually, when she went to school, she went with uh, Scarlett Johansson. Oh, really? Uh Uh-huh. She went to school with school kids. Children, uh, Mikhail Kulkin was one of them, but there was also his brother and the sister. I remember they were three of them, three Kulkins there. And uh, then she, uh, after that, later on, uh, she went uh, to Boston University. That was already after she was modeling for a few years. Mm-hmm. And she comes home one day and she says, you know, I don't want to be a bimbo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <What do you laughs> <mean? laughs> I will go to university. It's time for me to go to university. So she applied to many famous universities around, and she was accepted to Boston, NYU, and some other university. I'm not sure if it was Brown. I don't. I don't know. And so she is. Uh, Enter as a pre match, first year as a pre match. She says, I'm going to go into medicine. I said, Fine, <laughs> you will be doing it, not me. <laughs> After the first year, she comes home and she says, You know, mom, I have done something. You're not going to like it. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> she says, I have changed into international relationship, my studies. From, okay. from pre med to international, international relationship. International yeah. relation? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Go- Completely different, um, you know, subject. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I said, what can I do? It's her. She's adult now. This, this is what she wants to do. Mm-hmm. Um, then uh, that's what she wants to do. So, um, so, so Bianca was almost finished with the whole study, the four year, and uh, she, uh, she skipped the last semester and she did not graduate. She just decided, I don't know what went on at that point. <laughs> During this uh, four year study while she was in Boston, she spent one semester in Barcelona. You know, they could do um, semesters outside the university. So she went to Barcelona. She studied at the university there for one semester, and she did one semester here in NYU in New York. Uh, Bianca was not really into the boys. She had a first boyfriend when she was in Boston University. She was already over 20 years old. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. She was not into the boys, really. <laughs> but that was her boyfriend. So I was so excited. I said, oh my God, she finally had a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we had some um, disagreements throughout the lifetime also on a different allowance said um, about Bianca was uh, in Boston University. She became a partier, you know, mm-hmm. she, 
you know, you know how that goes. <laughs> well, it, I mean, there's a lot of everywhere. It's like people become yeah. partiers for a lot of different reasons. And Lots sometimes it's, it's really the social requirement. Like if you're going to be able to communicate with the power players in your in your school environment or in your work environment, people end up being partiers in different ways. So that's always very interesting to me. Um, myself, I've had I've had experiences of that, too, um, that that are that are, uh, you know, my own. But uh, I, I'm always interested in in what that is for people and it, yeah. it, it, there are always layers of it that are not obvious obvious yeah you know you have to realize that bianca's schooling was a little bit different be because of her modeling she went to the boston university when she was older mm -hmm. actually because uh, she finished first two years of high school that was everything on schedule then we moved to new york and she started actively modeling she skipped one year and then she returned back to the high school to complete those two other two years. Okay. And then she took another year off because she was modeling. She was living in Paris and Milan and she was all over the place. And then she decided to go to university. So she was already like 20, 20 21 or in that age, 20, 21, when she actually entered Boston University. And so she had the first boyfriend at that time. Yeah. I said, I'm glad that you finally have a boyfriend. It sounds like she, she had things she was really committed to. She was committed, very yeah. committed. Yeah. And so as a child, Bianca did ballet for a while, for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, she started growing, she becoming taller. So it was not really for her anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. She really enjoyed though. She really, I used to make these different costumes, you know, for different presentation. And that was when we lived in Canada. She had um, a Russian ballet dancer who was her teacher. And, um, you know, so I was making these different um, costumes for her sewing. Um, she also did swimming. She enjoyed swimming. She liked camping the nature, the travel. She was an avid reader. She liked to read all the time. She was reading all the time. Then she did these winter sports. She did uh, skating and the skiing, as I told you. She used to travel with her dad to Montremblant in Quebec, in Canada. And they used to go skiing together. That was beyond my time. I would not do those things anymore. <laughs> And then later on, she used to travel after she came back, after she returned from Boston University, she used to travel to um, Colorado and Utah for her skiing. And she used to also travel to Sundance Festival there in that area. Oh, the Sundance, uh -huh. the Sundance Festival. Yeah, that's awesome. She, uh -huh. And she always, every year she used to attend the Sundance Festival. As a child, Bianca was extrovert. As I said, she was a people loving, she loved animals. When she was in that um, schooling in Key West, I'm not sure if it was the middle school or if it was the high school, she did a big project on the birds of Florida Keys. <laughs> it was a really nice project. I was really impressed. I was very proud of her, you know. She really like animals and, uh, you know, all these stuff, you know. I love birds too. Uh -huh. <laughs> she collected, that was a massive collection <laughs> of picture and information, you know, on these birds of the, the country in Key West. I would, I would love to, I would love to see that if you ever find it. That sounds really yeah. cool. It's still somewhere, probably. <laughs> She, she was very exploratory as a child. Mm -hmm. You know, she she enjoys Halloween and the Christmas. She liked to help me to bake for the Christmas. We used to bake the cookies together. <laughs> and Halloween, she also enjoys to prepare the cost, costumes, you know, and do, do the stuff like that. When she was small, I never can forget that. She got lost in the mall. She was maybe six. Oh. years old or something yeah. and we go shopping one summer that was in Windsor in Ontario and uh, those days there was few kids who disappeared and so we shop and I am looking through the you know the clothing and she stood by my side 
And then I turned my head and she was gone. Mm -hmm. My heart bounced. I, I froze. I was running around the mall and running. And I said, oh, my God, where is she? She was just here a minute ago. I just turned my head and was looking through the clothing. And I looked back and she's gone. And as I'm running through the, this, this big mall, I hear overhead announcement. There is a young lady and she says her name is Bianca and she's looking for her mother. She lost her mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, wow. what did you do to me? I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> so she, uh, later on in her life, she also, she liked to play tennis with her dad. They used to go play tennis. She really enjoyed tennis. And with me, we used to do lots of hiking into Canadian backcountry, you know, like a backpacking. Yeah. So we, yeah, that was when we had a dog. We had a Dalmatian dog. <laughs> so... So we used to take him and we used to do like, a, we would go for a week. That was already later on in her life. What was the dog's name? A Dolce Vita. A Dolce Vita is a great name. It's like sweet life in Italian. <laughs> it's like sweet great life. name. Okay. Blessings to Dolce Vita and Bianca. <laughs> and Bianca, they're both like Italians. <laughs> <laughs> With Bohemian background. <laughs> well, her color, her favorite color when she was young was always pink. So it was very easy for me to buy something. I just was buying everything in pink. Oh, right. sure. <laughs> it was very easy. <laughs> Later on, she, of course, she, when she grew up and become adult, you know, you cannot do that. <laughs> when she was young, well, like very little girl, she liked everything pink. Mm -hmm. yeah. Her food, what she likes, she was more like, she had lots of junk food, actually, which did not make me happy. <laughs> As a child, Bianca would never play with the dolls. Never. She was not this, this type of girl who would play with the dolls. She liked uh, to play, uh, use different games where she had to think. She liked to do puzzles, uh, different games, uh, books. That's what she liked. She was never happy if she was to get a doll from somebody as a present for Christmas. She would just look at it and lay down and that was it. She never cared for it. She has sounded very much like an active thinker in a uh -huh. lot of the ways that you've described her. She was very much of the active thinker. Um, so uh, w she was about eight, nine years old, and uh, we spoke with her primarily English, uh, very uh, little bit of Bohemian Czech language. Um, so she was not really uh, fluent in Czech language. She knew a few words just. And at that point, she says, I'm going to see my grandma to Czech Republic. <laughs> well, that's going to be kind of difficult. Because the grandma does not speak English and you don't speak Bohemian Czech language. So how are you going to communicate with her? Well, we will do it. Did she, do, <laughs> did she go by herself? She went. Yeah, so we, we put her on the plane. Grandma came in Prague. She came to pick her up from the airport. And the first thing what grandma did, she bought her a book, which is given to the children there when they enter the grade one, mm -hmm. first grade. And she got this book and she started learning Czech bo Bohemian language. But, but she just started when she got there? Uh-huh. That made no reason. Uh -huh. She knew just the very few words. That I, few words. Yeah, I think, uh -huh. like, in so many ways, that's the ideal language learning experience where you, uh -huh. you have family who loves you and... You may not speak their language, but but they, you know, you you want to know one another, and so you you're suddenly immersing yourself in and, in language that you're not familiar with. That that sounds really like a wonderful experience to me. Yeah, she really, um, and she became very close. That was her grandma from uh, my husband's side, you know, her mm -hmm. pat paternal grandmother. And they became very close, you know. Um, Bianca from that point started to travel there like every summer. She really enjoyed this grandma. <laughs> and um, so when she was about 10 years old, I have decided um, I'm going to take two months off from work. And uh, I took, I said, you know, I have to immerse Bianca into European culture. 
because she's European, even though she was born here, uh, she's European, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I said, I'm going to take her for two months trip. I have uh, leased a car in uh, Amsterdam. And I took her throughout the Europe, you know, so she understands the culture, she understands the history and everything. It was kind of like a learning experience for her. I said, I'll do this as a learning experience for her. Mm-hmm. So we started in Amsterdam uh, and we traveled through the Benelux, which is Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg. So we, uh, and we practically visit every little area every uh, castles and uh, museums and Bianca was really into European castles. She really, she really enjoyed it. You know, she wanted to go to every castle and she wanted to see what's inside. Yeah, (laughs) I agree. (laughs) Yeah, she was really into it. And then later on, we did some cruises together. I traveled to London with her a few times and uh, the Czech Republic. And that was the... throughout the lifetime but she did some other traveling on her own also Mm -hmm. um she um she was uh, Bianca had a religion she was not really a religious person she was spiritual even though she was baptized in um, Anglican church in Canada she was just spiritual when she was um, in her uh, grade school in Canada, because you have to learn French, that's a second language in Canada, so she started learning French, which she continues throughout her, even when she went to Boston University, when she went to high school, she learned French throughout the whole, all her life while she was at school. So she was fluent in French. And then when she was in Florida, she also learned Spanish, you know, because that's a uh, you know, you have to learn Spanish here, so. Mm-hmm. And then Bohemian Czech language. When we live in Florida, one day she comes home and she tells me, you know, I am going to run the seven mile marathon. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> there is the seven mile bridge. It's called seven mile bridge when you travel into Florida Keys, when you travel to Key West. And every year there is a marathon. And she signed up. She was about 15, 16 years old. And she signed up by, for, to run the marathon. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And um, so she was, there was a cluster of people who ended up like the winners. It was few of them. And she was one of those people. That's really awesome. Isn't it the first marathon that she ever signed That's up for? first marathon, yeah. Awesome. Uh-huh. And um, I come work next day and one of my uh, colleague nurses she was a runner too and she tells me you would not believe it i got so upset there was this girl she was about 15 16 years old and she was between the winners i <laughs> said so that's my daughter <laughs> <laughs> but then she kind of mellowed down <laughs> When we live in New York, she would go, she would run, we live on Upper East Side, and she would run from Upper East Side all the way, uh, from 70th Street, all the way to Central Park by Reservoir, you know, Jackie Kennedy on Assis Reservoir there, and she would run a few times around and then run back. Wow. She was an excellent runner, but she was also tall and she had a, you know, very skinny, long leg. <laughs> Is that like a regular, what was, did she have regular routes she would go running in the city? Like, oh, like, yeah. um, did she go like, like once a week or did she go every day or like, what was that like for her? She, she would go when she had, that was already when she was modeling. So when she was in New York, because sometimes she would stay in Paris for a while and uh, at, uh, elsewhere. So when she was in New York, she would do that like two, three times a week. Yeah. I I have really, really fond memories of going running in the city when I visited my, my aunt in Manhattan. Um <laughs> Uh, that's really cool. Thank you yeah. for asking me about that. That was her route. She was not doing any other routes. This mm-hmm. was her route. She would run from 70th and York Avenue, where we lived on a priest site, and she would run all the way to Central Park, to, to the reservoir, and then she ran a few times around the reservoir and ran back. And she was also involved in gym. She would all her life, she was going to gym, except those years when she moved to Hawaii, then that stopped because of the injury to the ankle. Yeah. After. 
Yeah. As a, as a young girl, Bianca, um, uh, she was a tomboy, actually. She started as a tomboy. She was always in jeans and, you know, she really looked like a boy more. <laughs> she was a beautiful tomboy. <laughs> and as I was mentioning at that point, her uh, friend from the high school, Christina, who was the commercial model in Miami. And then uh, everything started for Bianca. We, we did not expect it that this is going to happen. One day we uh, go to Miami to the mall and Bianca was approached by a lady named da Nadia. Nadia was a stylist for Versace. Giovanni Versace, mm -hmm. when Giovanni was still alive. And Nadia was married to this male fashion model who was American and uh, he used to do the shows in Milan. I think that that where they met. And uh, so Nadia was this Italian, she was Italian, she was a stylist for Versace and she married Eric, uh, who was the former fashion model. But he became a photographer, like a fashion photographer. So Nadia approached us and said, I really want to work with your daughter. I said, okay, so we can arrange for that. So then we would go a few times to Miami and Eric would take initial pictures of Bianca because he became become a fashion photographer at that point. And... Um, they send the pictures to um, agencies in Miami, but Miami would not want it, Bianca, because uh, they said Bianca is more editorial model. She does not look like commercial model. There is a difference. You know, I think they said commercial girls, they are in every magazine, you know, like a... Uh, Macy's and this different thing and the editorial model they use them like for walk and these other magazines so, so it's sort of like the editorial models are tending to be with more written pieces and the commercial models are more with like products like clothing or do I yeah. under uh -huh. is that correct yeah. I don't know much like about that, this yes yeah. it's more like commercial mm -hmm. models they uh they use them like in those uh different magazines like you know the, the commercial model is very pretty girl who looks uh, at so many of them mm -hmm. but uh, if they are editorial they are like exotic or something okay like different looking okay. <laughs> whatever <laughs> industry <laughs> classifications right yeah that's an industry I, I didn't know about this nothing about uh, until Nadia told me about this okay and uh, so at that point, Bianca really changed from the tomboy. She started to paying an attention to her beauty. She started to buying dresses, you know, very cute dresses we used to buy for her and the high heels and um, her makeup line. She was, uh, her ma favorite makeup line was Clinique at the beginning. She would buy everything in Clinique. She would never apply that much makeup, but, you know, just to have it, you know? Yeah. So then, um, uh, so as I said, uh, you know, Bianca was not accepted in the, those agencies in Miami because she was not a commercial model. So we had to travel to New York, you know. There was one, uh, something of interest would cross my mind uh, just a few months ago or maybe a year ago. This name, uh, Jean-Luc Brunel. Yeah. I noticed I noticed that name when I was uh -huh. when I was scanning through the page. Yeah, Bianca was uh, at one point. Uh, we had to go. There was something for the beginning models in Orlando, and Nadia said maybe you should take Bianca there. You know, it was like uh, some competition or whatever. They can sign. There some agencies were there who would sign them up like that you know mm -hmm. so i went i traveled with bianca to orlando it was sometimes i think like in 96 97 in that time and i had met that man there you met jean-luc brunel there yes okay. yes I, yes i have met him there not really like uh you know it was only i'm jack like brunel and uh, you know i am here to you know whatever i you know, he was one of those people who were signing 
uh, one of those people who organize who were organizing this stuff there yeah you know and uh, i did i did not know anything about him i know he was uh, representing one of the agencies which was represented there at that time uh later on about a few months ago or a year ago when this happened that he died his name came back to my mind. I said, oh, my God, his association with Epstein. I did, not, I did not know anything about it. Yeah. And I remember that man, his, you know, I remember him visually in my mind. Um, you know, when I look at him, I did not like something about him. You know, I have this intuition when I look at the people, there is something I don't like about them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's uh, something what always comes to my mind. And when I, uh, you know, saw his association with Epstein, it's really, um, it was something, yeah. Did Bianca meet him also? I met him together because there was a lot of like the parents, uh, you know, it was like an agency. Uh, those days, uh, things were done differently, you know, mm -hmm. um, when they were scouting for the models. You know, uh, and uh, Nadia, who was the um, the stylist for Versace, she said maybe you should find no agency would sign up Bianca here in uh, Miami. Maybe uh, it's good to attend this event, right? Mm -hmm. Be because Bianca is very beautiful. We did all the pictures and everything, you know, and so we attended that. But I was not very interested uh, in this for Bianca. I was not very interested in that. Mm. And then so uh, knowing Nadia, um, we also met Giovanni Versace mm. one day before he was gunned down by Andrew Cunanan. And um, so... Um, at the 97, uh, sometimes in April, uh, Nadia and Eric, they, they said, okay, Bianca is not a commercial model. Uh, we have to try elsewhere. We are going to send the pictures to New York. Mm -hmm. So all the pictures Eric produced of Bianca, they sent to Wilhelmina. They immediately, within the week, we had a response uh, from Wilhelmina and they said, we're going to sign up Bianca. So in May 97, I brought Bianca to New York. And um, so in the morning, we had an appointment with the head of the agency and we come in and the contract was ready for Bianca. It was her first contract. So we come in and we talk to the guy and, um, you know, he explained the contract and everything. And uh, I was very proud of Bianca. Every girl would be proud, you know. Yeah. And uh, so um, every girl would be happy and the mother would be proud, I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Bianca turns to the head to me and she says, you know what, I'm not signing this. <laughs> said, oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't say anything. So I told the guy, you know what, we're going to return. We're going to go out for a walk and we're going to come back. Uh -huh. We have never, we never went back. <laughs> What did she say about it? As soon, mm -hmm. as soon as we get out, she tells me, you know, I don't want to go with Belhamina. I want to go with elite agency. Uh -huh. You don't understand. I said, okay, well, let's go to elite agency. And we are here in New York. We might as well do it. So we were on Park Avenue somewhere in the 20th. And the, the elite was somewhere on the 22nd, if I recall. And so we, in the morning, New York was a different place those days. It was really had energy, you know. The city was booming. Now it's completely dead. But those days, New York was through New York. And so in the morning, we are walking. We are crossing the intersection. It was somewhere on Park Avenue. And then suddenly touch, somebody touches my shoulder. And it was a guy with Australian accent. And he asked me, is this your daughter? I said, yes. He said, you know, I am a booker for elite agency. You have to come with me. Wait, you hadn't gone to visit the elite agency yet? And a no, booker either. found you I... on the street? Is that what, what you said? Yes, we were on the way to elite wow. agency. He was walking in the morning to, to the work, to the elite agency. We were just about one half <laughs> away from the elite agency. And he taps on my shoulder. And he had a very, he was very cute. He had a nice Australian <laughs> accent. 
<laughs> so, so he said, you know, I'm a booker for your lead agency, you know, and is this your daughter? I said, yes. So he said, you have to come with me. I'm going to sign her up. I said, so almost incredible. Everything was happening within this like couple of hours. Did you, know? you tell anyone that you were going there next? Yes, I told him after. I told him after. I, oh, I mean, before before he tapped you on the shoulder, did anyone else know that you were going there except you and Bianca having just talked about it? No, nobody knew about oh, it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. So we went there and Bianca signed a contract. It took a few hours. They took some pictures of her and everything. Mm -hmm. And so she was very happy. So then we returned back to Key West and she had a contract already with Elite. So I told her, you know, since you have this contract, we have to move to New York. You know, you cannot be going there by yourself. You know, um, we, we moved there and that's it, you know, because for me to find a nursing job is not no problem, mm -hmm. you know. So we had relocated to New York in 97 and um, from Key West. And so Bianca stayed with um, elite agency uh, for about a year only. Something she did not like also. She came to me and uh, we talk about it. I don't want to mention it here. Something has happened within that agency. And... Uh, and and she said, you know, I am going to go with different agency. I said, fine. Mm -hmm. So she went to a woman's agency. She wanted to go with woman's agency. We had met the lady who ran the uh, woman's agency, Simone. But Simone would not sign her up. But she, um, there was a new agency started at that point called New York Model Management. They are like number one agency now. And so Bianca signed sign up with them. And actually from them, she got so much work. That's where her career actually picked up. So while Bianca was with Elite that year, she did a few uh, shows only. Those were primarily like a trunk shows. At one of the shows she did with Ivanka Trump. Ivanka Trump used to model. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And yeah, that's uh, where we met Ivana Trump. So I went to the show with Bianca. That's where I kind of met Ivana Trump. And not, not really like, I, I said, just hi, this is, I'm Bianca's mother. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> not, no, no any talking. And um, so those were like a truck shows. Those were shows for um, initial designers who were like starting to develop their own line, you know, fashion line. Mm. And um, that was while Bianca was still with Elite. Then she did some uh, spreads in ID magazine. It was those uh, lower class magazines. It was nothing really significant. But when she uh, signed up with New York Model Management, then, then it really picked up for her that her career really took off. And so uh, Bianca identified very well with the fashion business. You know, she was very responsible. I remember those days, you know, because sometimes models, they have to be very early on different go -sees when they, go, they call it go-see, when they go see uh, designers and photographers. Mm -hmm. And they carry their com cards and their portfolio. So Bianca was so organized. You know, she had everything well together. They were not supposed to wear makeup, you know, because they wanted to see them how they really look without the makeup, mm -hmm. you know, to have a picture. Um, what they going to wear the clothes or whatever, uh, eventually what they would use them for. So Bianca was extremely responsible. If she had to do some go very early in the morning, she would be already like up at five and getting herself together. She was very responsible with that. So then once she signed with New York Model Management, as I said, her career took off and she did uh, some of uh, her important fashion shows. The most important, I think, was Milan, the Fendi show in year 2000, um, where uh, she met Carol Lagerfeld. 
And there was actually, I don't know where that picture disappeared. There was one picture of Bianca and Karl Lagerfeld. It was on internet and they call Bianca's face Eternal Beauty. Hmm. Uh-huh. It was very, very nice picture. Very nice picture of her. I don't think I recognize the name. Um, could could you say the name of the person again? That you you just you mentioned it twice, but I didn't hear it quite uh, clearly. Uh, Karl Lager, Lagerfeld. He was a designer for Fendi. Lager Lagerfeld. Yes. Oh, that okay. I see. It. Okay, I understand. He always used to wear sunglasses. <laughs> and sure. gray hair. Yeah, you probably must have seen his picture. I think he died. Also. I I put his Jewish. name into Google as soon as I figured out how to spell it, and I, I recognize uh-huh. his face, but I I don't know his work well or anything like that. Yeah. So that was one of the Bianca's, um, you know, main sh- uh, shows. What she did uh, with uh, many of her famous models, like Devon Aoki. Uh, Maggie Reiser, Angela Lindwall, Bianca did, did some more stuff with Angela Lindwall uh, later on. She did some things also with uh, Amber Valletta and um, Eva Hersikova, Alec Weck. Giselle Batchen was in that show also. That, that was a big show in Milan. And Stella Tennant, Bianca became a friend with Stella Tennant later on. Um, then she did a smaller show here in New York uh, for a designer called Matt Nye. She also did some shows in Paris. Paris. Uh, it was for Dries Van Newton and Veronique Brantino and Veronique Leroy. And there was one of the Belgian designers. I remember Olivier Tovkian. Uh, she did some show for him also. Bianca was in many magazines. She was never on the cover, but she was in many story spreads. You know, she, she was in Italian Vogue, uh, French Vogue, British Vogue. She, tra- she did two trips to Japan, two summers. I think it was 2001 and 2002. While she was already at the university, she still modeled for a while. Uh, she did some, uh, sh- uh, some uh, spread for uh, a Japanese work called Nippon with uh, Brazilian uh, male model Fernando Johan. And uh, she, she was in other magazines like WID, Harper's Bazaar, Ella, Marie Claire, Vanity Fair and Glamour. She was in many, place, uh, many places at that point. Her career really took off. She had agency in New York, so that was her base agency, but because she did work outside, so she had an agency also in Milan, in pa- Paris, and London, and the Tokyo. How she many work? Oh, oh I, I, I wonder if I could ask, how many years was she in the modeling industry actively? Was she, was she active uh, and working? She was between 97 and 2002. Uh-huh. And 2002, that was her last trip to Japan okay. when she did that spread for Woke Nippon with Fernando Johan, and then she left the industry. It sounds full of amazing adventures. Uh-huh. Wow. She could have continued, but uh, she just wanted to go to university. So <laughs> I have to just do, you know, whatever she wanted to do. You know what I mean? It's um, It was her life, you know, so... Mm-hmm. And she worked with many important photographers like Michael Compton, Goldberg, Stephen Meisel, uh, Mario Sorrenti. She did some work with Mario Sorrenti, uh, Satoshi Saikusa, uh, Dirk Bickenberg. But the most prominent photographer and whom Bianca really likes, she really likes Stephen Meisel. She really would talk about him and she really liked him as a photographer and as a person. Um, Bianca attended Naomi Campbell's birthday party in Rome also. She did, uh, she was a friend for a little bit with Stella Tennant, uh, who is the granddaughter of Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. And they also did one photo shoot uh, on their property in Chatsworth. And I have actually got the, um, one of the magazines somebody sent me to last year from UK, where Bianca is, which is done on that property. 
she worked with other uh, models like Severin, who was a French male model. She worked with Linda Evangelista. Mm-hmm. She was friend with Verushka. Verushka was a German model, was very famous in 1960s, 1970s. Uh, she also did some project work with Iman. Iman was the wife of David Bowie. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, well, David Bowie died, but uh, Iman, they did some uh, project um, on cosmetic. And the, there is a book somewhere. Bianca was very proud of it. We have a book. Um, book is here somewhere. <laughs> I just would have to look for it. I, I would love to, whenever whenever you run across things, um, things that are on the internet or books that might be available, or if there are, there may be galleries online that uh, reflect some of some of what what Bianca was involved in. Um, I, I would always be interested to know where that stuff is and if it's already in public or if it's something you want to share. I know that there yeah. are community members who would love to meet her that way too, if that makes sense. What I want to do with that website, you know, I told yeah. you that website, I want to bring everything on that website. I want to bring not only what has happened to her, but also everything about her life. Who she oh, was. yes. Let's do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh-huh. After the trial, now this is going to be my next project uh, uh, to build that website, to build it very really well and bring everything, you know, like there may be uh, spreads from that book. Uh, from I have lots of magazines. Bianca was in all those books. I have a whole big box of it. Mm-hmm. So all these, uh, you know, different pictures to bring there, bring that picture from her regular life and everything like that, everything about her who she was, because Bianca was very humble. She was not like um, any other girl. I would tell her sometimes, if I would be you, everybody now would know I am a model. <laughs> she, wouldn't, she didn't want the people even to know that. Mm-hmm. You know, she was very humble. Uh, so when she was graduating from professional children's school, there was the day she was supposed to attend the graduation. And at that point, uh, the agency told her, you know what, you have to fly to that day, the day before, you have to fly to Milan to meet Miuccia Prada. She wants you in her show. Mm-hmm. And I said, Bianca, it's your graduation. You cannot miss. This is a high school graduation. You have everything ready for the graduation. You know, all those uh, dresses and whatever you need is ready for graduation. And you're going to Milan. She says, no, Mutual Prada is more important. <laughs> <laughs> so she left, she, she, she called the school, just sent me my diploma. And she flew to Milan to meet Mutia Prada. And then she flew from there to San Francisco directly to do some other photo shoot. <laughs> so she completely avoided her. I was so excited to go to her graduation, which has never happened. <laughs> Oh, she yeah. it, 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 she was she was achieving in all of these other ways. Yeah, um, was, some of them are not compatible with the with the traditional ones. <laughs> it was not she was not very into the traditional. Okay, I'm graduating from high school, so they can just send me my diploma, and that's it. <laughs> this is more important to me to, to meet me with Chia Prada. <laughs> so. Because I was working as a nurse, but in reality, I was actually Bianca's uh, assistant. I was the assistant to the model. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how that happened. Parents yeah. find themselves in, in that situation. We, well, I mean, when you can re- when you can support something that is so meaningful to her, and like we, you know, to be together <laughs> as family in accomplishing things like that. Um, that that's really it, it's a wonderful thing. We we think about that a lot, especially when we notice where where it's missing for people, where they yes. don't they don't get to have family relationships like that. And it's wonderful to celebrate where where we have had them. So at one point, um, 
you know, it would work like this when Bianca was with this professional children's school. That that school was established almost a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was so established uh, primarily to assist people who are in the art, like actors, um, musicians, um, models, uh, ballet dancers, and all these people, you know, who need to go to school to get their, uh, you know, uh, high school graduation and also be able to pursue the art you know for the kids like that who so they can do this mm. so the way how it was set up Bianca would always when she was here she would go to school they would uh, prepare the whole program for her when she had to travel let's say she needed to go to Paris for a couple of weeks so so they would prepare the program for her from all the subjects she would take it with her and then bring it back. And that's the way how she completed her high school. That's the way how it's done, this professional children's school. It's a private school. It's very expensive, kind of. I used to pay up to $17,000 a year for that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was needed for her so she can continue both. So I said, whatever, it's only a money. <laughs> I'm just like printing them now anyway. Well, I, I mean, it means access to completely different levels of industry that are otherwise... Yeah blocked off from That's from most people's access so i mean it, it it's a professional tool set that's mm -hmm. being paid for and yeah the school was very good i was very proud of her as i said she had that on the honor at all she was the second there was some boy who was ahead of her mm -hmm. but uh you know her education was very good from that school that's you know wonderful very good education. It was worth the money, actually. Well, it sounds you know? like she. It sounds like she was able to stay con like consistently very focused. Like you talk about her being a partier, but it sounds like she was really actively achieving. So whatever her partying was for her, it. I mean, I I sort of keep getting the sense like maybe it strengthened her in some way, but I don't want to. I don't know her very well. Um, yeah, but, but there's something that comes through that. So I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe you could speak to that in some way. You know, um, actually, when she was still, when she was modeling from that 97 until 2001, she was not a partier. Mm -hmm. She was extremely responsible, extremely. I have never seen anybody so responsible. I am not even a sister. So did it did it seem like her partying was the, in Boston University? Was it was it the less responsible kind of partying? Is that why you you sort of put them next to each other like that? No, she never party actually at the time. It was uh, everything started in Boston University. Once she entered Boston University, uh -huh. it was like I was like, oh my god, what has happened? Well, well, I saw it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I want to let you finish. It's so very, yeah. it's very interesting to me. Because uh, when she was modeling, even though it, she was in the fashion world, mm -hmm. everybody would say these people party. No, she was extremely responsible, extremely. She would not uh, smoke. She would not drink nothing. Once she entered Boston University, uh, it was like switch. That I, I, that that sounds to me like like I I just can't help but think of all of these situations where you enter an academic or professional environment I, like a college like I, a university um and then the only way to really communicate with people who are engaging in power structures there is to be socially um so active in the social scene in some yeah. way. And and so I don't know how much you've really said about that, um, but we could talk more about that if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. No, so I, I don't know. Um, I feel that these big universities, to me, when I look at back now at it, at that point, I did not understand, uh, you, you know, the uh, Ameri American universities, how they are set up because I was educated in Europe mm -hmm. and in Canada. Yeah, you know, oh, my nursing. So I did not understand. But, you know, when I look at this education back now, it's not a good education. I have to say that it's not. It's lacking. Because if these kids are allowed, there are parties going on like a <laughs> we would never do this in Europe or in. I am not saying that we were not partying. We did. 
yeah. but the the school was priority. And on the weekend, yes, you could go party or whatever, yeah, but this was like almost on the only day. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so that I that there are a lot of I so I won't I won't bring it up now because we've been talking for about an hour. But what I would really like to do is if we I mean, we might want to revisit this part of the conversation just as part of continuing, because I know you have more notes and I would love to record more. Um, just focusing more on what we've been talking about, about Bianca's life. Um, and at the same time, I notice, you know, some of the stuff that we're talking about really is going to inform more of our other conversations about um, how how our environment's being acculturated. So okay. like, you know, we, we we've been talking in previous recordings about how professional environments are are being that they're being influenced in ways that keep the professionals from being able to do what they're there to do um yes. because people people can't take responsibility as professionals because there's something about the environment that 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 is acting against that and we okay. see that a lot in academic environments too and so i start wanting to ask you questions at some point about um you know, if you are seeing a really, it was, it, you, you, you were seeing that, that daily partying atmosphere at Boston University. Is that what you were saying? I, I, I went there a few times and I wanted to observe for myself. So I was kind of like doing like a gizmo journalism. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. And because I wanted to see what's going on. How come Bianca has changed so much? She was between uh, all these fashion people and she was completely like so responsible. And suddenly everything is like falling apart. I said, what is going on here? Well, there are a lot of things that, that we that we talk about in the network that, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we talk about in the network, it never goes very far outside private groups of survivors talking about it with one another. Because when they have broached it other places, it, it hasn't been okay for them to talk about it. But one of the things that I feel a lot more comfortable talking about these days is how, um, so in a, in a school environment, in, uh -huh. a, in a university environment, we are often seeing um, mechanisms of influence that yes. get people to party uh -huh. So that so like there are a bunch of things I could say, and I don't know if I want to bring those into our conversation right now, but I would love to keep talking about them. Oh, about um, them yeah. And I'll just I'll just like reference a little, um, for instance, getting people into compromising positions at parties and then having information about them that lets you influence their career and what decisions they make and what they do with their money once they're okay. popular. And so to hear that someone who is not at all a partier goes to a university environment and is is suddenly, you know, cultivating and all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. In the intersection. You know, when I look um, at the Key West High School and this uh, private professional children's school, those two schools, I was extremely satisfied, extremely mm -hmm. satisfied. I was very happy. That was a best thing for Bianca where she went. That was a good school, right? But to uh, at Boston University, looking back at it, back at it now, I was not pleased. And people think, you know, I graduate from a, such a prestigious university, but really, I don't know. I really don't know about that. You know, what everything is allowed for kids to do there. I know that, uh, you know, the school does not uh, support that, but they still can do it. You know what I mean? So it's, I don't know, somehow I was not happy with that. How? And if I have that oh. to, to make that choice over again, I would not allow for her to go there. I would not allow it. I would want her to be close to her, be um, in any college here within the city or go to NYU, be closer, so I can kind of have a, a better control. How long was she at Boston University? Uh, she was there for four years. Ex except two semesters. She was actually, um, one semester she was in Barcelona, in Spain. 
at the university there, they could travel outside, you know, at the university and take uh, semesters elsewhere. And one semester she did here in NYU. And actually, I was kind of observing when she was home and she was uh, taking that semester in NYU. She was, that was different, Bianca was not a partier. She would come home, she would study. She was very much, you know, mm -hmm. productive, let's say, put it this way. <laughs> and then she went back, did she go uh -huh. back to Boston University? Uh -huh. after then that? she went back. Uh -huh. And she went when, back. what year did she graduate Boston? <laughs> she did not, uh, so she did first, second year, the third year, uh, she went uh, first semester of the third year, she went to Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And the second semester of the third year, she went to NYU here. Mm -hmm. And then she returned back to Boston for the last year. And she did that first semester of the fourth year and that she did not complete. Oh, what year was that? That was in 2005, I think. But she did not, she did not complete last semester. She, she just left the university with a missing last semester to graduate. It yeah. really, it starts to really sound like the requirements of the academic environment. You're, re you're required to be a partier while you're there, but you're not a partier anywhere else. Yeah. But if you're going yeah. to succeed uh -huh. in the frameworks that are there, that yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah it was a very interesting thing. Bianca also lived very interesting lives, you know, because it worked like this when she was still in this professional children's school and she was, at that point, she was modeling. She was practically living between Milan, Paris and New York. So she would go to the school, she would come back home and she maybe would go to school for a week. And then one day she calls me, you know, pack my luggage. I have to fly tonight to Milan or to Paris. You know, so I was like an assistant, you know, <laughs> packing the luggages and unpacking, and, you know, preparing the stuff, you know, so it was a very interesting lifestyle. Yeah, we had some disagreement on different things, on allowances. We had disagreement also when she was at Boston University because Bianca was the party as she started to drink at that point. I was not happy with that. She started to smoke, which she never did before. Was that Even... Boston University where <laughs> it seemed that that influence was? Yes. Uh -huh. She never did that before. Before she would not even drink the coffee because it would stain her teeth. <laughs> what was the year of, what was the year that her ankle injury happened? That happened, uh, that happened in uh, years back. That was already when she oh. uh, went to Hawaii. Yeah. So at that point when Bianca was, uh, so at 2005, she returns back from uh, Boston and she um, was living here in New York. I got her apartment here in New York and uh, so for about four and a half years or so. And uh, she was, um, you know, enjoying her job. She was taking classes, uh, acting classes with the Ted Bundy studio. I think she was in, uh, she was in Esper or Strasbourg studio. I'm not sure which one. She was in one of those studios also. So she studied acting. She continued studied acting. She kept some little job like a hostess uh, for different restaurant, you know, and I was supplying her with the money also. Um, at that point, she was... Uh, dating um, her boyfriend uh, here in New York after she left the Boston University was Eric Offin. And Eric Offin, he used to own the sound post-production studios here in New York. And then he moved to LA. They dated for about a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So he got her a voiceover for a um, movie uh, with Sissy Spacek called Lake City. So she did that for a while and she did some other, maybe a couple more things like uh, voiceover for, for these movies. Um, when uh, we go back, um, so Bianca's dating actually started in Boston University. That was also, as I said before, mm -hmm. um, her favorite city was Paris. She loved Paris. She always loved to go back there, you know. Mm -hmm. Her favorite food 
It was hot sauce. <laughs> 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 she would put the hot sauce on everything, even on the cake. Oh, she would really? <laughs> she put hot sauce on cake? Yes, I'm not kidding. She would put hot sauce on everything. I even think that's that. genius. <laughs> she had these two friends, um, very close friends. Sometimes they used to travel together. They were both uh, gay men. And um, one of them always tells me, you know, Bianca, even now when I text with him sometimes, she, he, he said, Bianca like hot, hot sauce so much. She put it even on the cake. <laughs> <laughs> I could really, I think, I think like, like hot cocoa with, um, with, with, uh, uh, chili pepper powder mm -hmm. in it, or like, there are lots of recipes that mix sweet things and, and spicy things. And I think that's a great idea. Yeah. She likes her music. She likes house music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I didn't grow up in that music. I was more like, uh, you know, 70s, like rock and roll, you know, sure. like this, this type of music. So I am not really into house music. I like house music too. You do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you are Bianca's age. We, we, there, there are a number of interesting similarities. I'm not calling yeah. them all out, but I really, I'm really appreciating getting to know her. And I, yeah. I don't, I don't want to cut us off, but we've gone over. And I, if I don't, if I don't go take care of my body, I'm, I might not be able to hold up my end of the conversation. Um, I would really like to record another session and just stay in this conversation. Like we can talk for a few more minutes, but I just want to make sure that that we wrap up shortly. Yes. But um, okay. I mean, in addition to the other notes you have, I, I have a bunch of questions that I would really uh -huh. like to ask you, but I don't think I have time to really ask them. Um, I didn't. Okay. Uh, do, so, um, you know, I just go a little bit longer and uh, then we can stop. Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's wrap up wherever is most comfortable for you. And then I'll yeah. make some notes uh, before we record again and, and, and we'll just pick up where we left off. So Bianca, as I told you about uh, our dog, Dolce Vita, mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, his short name was actually Dolce. And, uh, he was photographed within the New York with Bianca because she used to parade with him on the Fifth Avenue. Oh. So they were in maybe in many newspapers. That together. sounds awesome. <laughs> yes. So we, I still have those pictures. Yeah. And um, she also wanted Cabana. I said, Bianca, no, I cannot have two dogs. <laughs> she wanted Dolce and Cabana. <laughs> I said, no, we cannot. We cannot really have like two dogs. Like Dolce and Gabbana? Yes. <laughs> That was her initial plan. She says, we're going to get a cabana. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> and that's not happening. <laughs> Dreams are important for manifesting yeah. reality with. Yeah. You never know. So she liked to go to the dog shows also. Oh. At one of the dog shows, she met Dr. Ruth. If you ever heard of yes, her. Yes, I do know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I don't know if she was the sex therapist. I don't know if she died already. Maybe I, she must be very old now. I haven't so seen anything from her in a while, but yeah, Bianca comes home and she says, "You don't know who I met at the dog show, Doctor Rubel." So we had a drink together. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> oh boy! So when Bianca was smaller, she had a birds, couple birds, couple. Part of, uh, part of kids. When she was small girl, she really liked, uh, liked that. She enjoyed them. <laughs> so, so that goes. And the um, last movie I have seen with Bianca was the movie uh, named The Road, what we see in the theater together. It's a very depressing movie, actually. I don't know why we went to see this. What was the, her, the name of it again? Uh, the Road. The, the Route? The Route. Or a, or a road, R O A D, like a road. Oh, the road. You travel. Uh huh. Okay. And her favorite movie, as she told me, and also her roommate, the guy she lived in Hawaii with, mm -hmm. told me was Turista. And that is that actually movie about illegal organ harvest. Turista. 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 Uh -huh. I don't it think was... I'm familiar with either of these. I'm not uh -huh. looking up. Yeah, that movie was apparently, uh, was taking place somewhere in South America. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, like uh, about illegal organ harvesting. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. 
And the Bianca was kind of against human trafficking. She would talk about it. You know, she was against human trafficking. She was against the genocide of native South American Indians, especially like in Paraguay, those places. She was very much for the preservation of the Amazon rainforest. When she went to Boston University, she actually specialized on uh, international re relationship uh, and her special specialty was in South America, was South America. Bianca very much liked to read Carl Sagan, hmm. if you are familiar with him. Yes. I yeah. don't know this book, though. You wrote down this book, Billions and Billions. Billions. And Billions. I don't know that one. So yeah. I, I'll look it up now. And she was never a avid musician. She played only flute, and that was in the grade school. They had some kind of band. She never played any, um, you know, any instrument. She liked to dance, but she never was into any, um, you know, I told her maybe if she would want to go to music school, you know, and like, um, you know, like outside the regular education, but she was not into it really that much. Yeah. She, um, she was um, so much into paranormal activities. She would always talk to me about it. She was, I don't know what was happening, but that's what she was into. Yeah. And then she moved to Hawaii and um, she became a member of Hawaiian Vegetarian Society. And um, she became vegan. She really liked Hawaii. She liked Hawaiian people. Um, she was planning, her plan was to travel further into Polynesia, but that has never happened because of her ankle injury mm. and that stopped her and left her in Hawaii. She did two, two revisions as we had talked about this before. And, um, I was telling her Bianca come back to New York and have it revised here at the special surgery, because obviously there are no people who can uh, do it. You know, you need somebody more experienced. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were planning on that and that has never happened. You know, many times Bianca would tell me, and that was closely before she died, um, not like in uh, maybe a year, or a year away or two years or prior, she would tell me um, that, you know, she lived like a, a full speed life, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, she was a jet setter practically, and uh, she would tell me sometimes, if you live uh, hundreds of years, you would never experience what I have experienced within the first 30 years of my life. Mm -hmm. You yeah. would never experience that. And she was right that I would never experience that. Yeah. Bianca traveled to many interesting places, you know, she traveled to Tunisia, Egypt, Morocco, Europe. She liked Ibiza. She liked Ibiza and uh, Mallorca, Majorca, those Spanish islands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she traveled a lot uh, within um, South America, like the least El Salvador, Costa Rica, and places like that, yeah. And after, you know, uh, whatever has happened to her in that hospital, you know, I don't think they knew who she was. And probably what has happened to her um, happens to many people there. It's only, it happened to her because they have no clue who she was. It's not supposed to happen to anybody. But they did not know who she was. In a care environment, uh -huh. we, we must be in relationship with one another. And yes. if people are in relationship with one another, they don't allow things like this to happen right in their meal. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And now when I'm thinking about all this, um, you know, um, what was done to her, uh, you know, within those uh, few days, practically, and all the cover-up afterwards, when they realized what was going to happen and you know it's it's almost indescribable there'll be always i will always feel the pain the pain will never go away because as i said if my daughter was to be attacked 
in the ocean by the shark. I can deal with it. Mm. But I can never deal having my only child murdered by healthcare professionals. Yeah. So many times she would travel alone to South America and I was already, oh my God, she is not going to come back. This is so dangerous. She was traveling to places I would never go by myself alone. And she always would come safely back. And she goes to the hospital here in the United States. You know, Hawaii is United States, consider. And she's not coming out. This is how dangerous that is. What can happen to us? And can happen to anybody, any one of us. I think nothing is guaranteed. Yeah. It is so deeply legitimate to say, I cannot, I, I cannot, I cannot deal with medical professionals murdering people. I cannot be okay with that. That's not something that that's not part of, of natural things that happen in natural environments. Um, and, <laughs> you know, also how they, uh, you know, all that cover up and how her body was returned to me, which I did not even know. You know, I, I find that after the cremation, that her body was actually returned to me without the organs and without her eyes. And she had the most beautiful eyes, very large, blue, beautiful eyes. I have, you barely can see these days. Yeah. As I said, the pain will never go away. I am so grateful that we can celebrate the the energy she brought into the world while she was among us living. And I really appreciate getting to know her through you and through our conversations and helping our community members get to know her through you and our conversations. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of different questions that have been emerging because we have been having these conversations and I, I'm going to organize those a little better and, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a list so that I can ask you questions later on when it's okay. the best time. Um, but meanwhile, for us to be periodically revisiting the most hard conversations, the conversations that are the most difficult ones for anybody to have until suddenly we have to. Because yes. if we don't, we're allowing medical professionals to murder people. Yes. And we're suggesting that we should just sort of get by in our lives and let that continue to go on, which is, I mean, that that's psychosis. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I tell you, when I started this lawsuit, I started this as a malpractice lawsuit. But now I know, now I know what was behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, because as a nurse, when I look at that medical record, there is more, there is a darker side than just malpractice by mistake. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I have found my passion now. I know what it is to fight this illegal organ harvesting. Because to me, it is illegal. No matter what laws we establish that, uh, to cover up, it's to me, it's always illegal and it always will be illegal. Because for us to get those organs, we have to murder the person. We're not going to get them any other way to have a viable organ. We have to murder somebody. And um, I will never agree with that. I cannot agree with that. It's wrong to murder one person because we want somebody else to live. It does not work that way. I think that God would not want it us to do it. There's something very different between the shark in the ocean in the shark's territory uh -huh. um, ending up eating another living being for whatever reason the shark is hung hungry or the shark is defending a, a boundary line or something yes. going on in the natural world and 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 to consider the difference between that and 
saying, here, here are our healthcare systems, here are the places where people are responsible and um, care about each other and, and do things to help one another. And in those very environments, we refuse to listen to people who tell what violence they have experienced. Uh -huh. um, and those systems keep people from saying what they need to say. So yeah. to, to, to rely on those systems is to be relying on something that is requiring and instilling psychosis in the people who, who, who rely on it. That's very scary. That's really, yeah. I mean, I don't know, I guess with the, you know, one kind of monster or another kind of monster, but I don't uh -huh. think the shark is a monster. I think we just have a misunderstanding. Uh -huh. with, the, with the medical professionals being co-opted, we've got trafficking organizations that are behaving monstrously on purpose, but the uh -huh. people involved often are doing monstrous things. They don't realize they're doing them for traffickers. They yeah. don't realize they're supporting this medical environment so that traffickers can benefit from it. Yeah. That's not the same as the shark. You know, um, it's not. No, <laughs> no it's not. It, uh, there is no comparison. There is no comparison. Am I I'm looking at this, uh, you know, after the Second War, when we had Nuremberg trials, we had promised that we'll never do this again. Well, they've and, ramped it up. They're doing mm -hmm. it more than ever, it seems. Yeah. And it took only ten, uh, two, one, two decades, and we are back at it in late 1960s when we started with this illegal organ harvesting. It took... Uh, only uh, one, two decades after the Nuremberg trials, when we promised we're never going to do this again. We have failed. We have break the promise. I think that the more we continue to have this conversation, the more people will be able to speak to these intersections and it will become impossible for the conversation to be silenced. It, it won't. It, it won't be possible per, for people to forget about it because everyone will know other people who have been affected by it. They just didn't realize it until more people were talking about it in public. Yes, I feel the same way. Thank you so much for everything that you bring to this in, in public media where it's so hard for people to participate in these conversations in public media. So anybody who can hold that space in a public conversation has such a huge impact for so many people who can't bar can't be part of the conversation yet, but they will be as soon as they get their feet under them, as soon as we manage to bring enough resources to one another, then we have a lot more voices. And then this kind of violence will not happen anymore. And yes. Bianca is part of that. And you are part of that in really powerful ways. Yes. Yeah, this has to stop. We cannot, uh, we have to respect the Nuremberg trial. What we got, we took the promise that we're going to respect that. And we had the trial for a reason, for all the atrocities what were happening during the Second War and prior. And it's back again to square one. It's like it never happened. You know, so I think we all have to be responsible adults and uh, like uh, to follow this, follow our promise to the other human beings and not to do those things. For us to wrap up on, I wonder if you think of any time that you learned something from Bianca about how we are brave in the midst of challenges. She sort of seems to me like someone who has, who has been transmitting that kind of energy. And I wonder if you can think of any experience that you had that we could share with those who are listening so that we can all feel strengthened as we, as we end this conversation and, and look forward to the next one. Well, Bianca always would, uh, Tell me that I should be, um, she liked people, as I said, she was a people person. And she would always, you know, bring to my attention, look how poor people live in Africa. Look at this, what's happening in Amazon rainforest. Look at this, what's happening around the globe. She was aware of those things. You know, those days I was so preoccupied with my job that I did not even know as much she knew. 
and she would be drinking those things to my attention, you know, and really, you know, like wanted to do something about this, even though she couldn't, how one person can do something about things like that. But it was bothering her what was happening. I could see that, that those things were bothering her. She yeah. was motivated and activated in a lot of your description. Yeah, she, those things were really bothering her. What was done to uh, different uh, groups of people, what was done to, you know, the environment and everything. She so, seemed to be really honoring what she was capable of. Yes. Yep. And we can learn from her to all of us together honor what we're capable of because we, we can change the circumstance where these things are occurring. And I think yeah, that's I, a pretty great takeaway. Yes. You know, that's why I don't want her to be seen as a blonde bingo, well, <laughs> you know, the, the model, but she was extremely knowledgeable extremely knowledgeable that was only the facade that was a pretend on outside but deep inside she had a brain and she can put the things together and she knew what was happening we are learning from her to look beneath the layers of appearance uh -huh. we are learning from her to to bring our full capacity into into our being activated in our day-to-day -day experiences. That's what I'm feeling from learning more about her from you. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's keep talking about this. And I have other questions that I would like to ask you. And you may have other things that you want to talk about um, yeah. uh, uh, that, that, that go right along with these notes. Um, I have a lot of things in my mind that's sort of hard to sort through, and I'm sure you do, too. I have much more, but, you know, I was just uh, like kind of trying to bring the most important things would cross my mind. I think we did moment. good. Yes. I think we did good. And, I mean, this is never easy. <laughs> I don't know anybody this is easy for. <laughs> It's not easy to talk about her. It's even more difficult now because we're going into trial with the next six weeks. Right. Uh, yeah, and it's becoming uh, more and more difficult. Yeah, it's real now. And before I could uh, try to distract myself with different things, it was easier for me to distract my mind with different things and kind of push it in the back of my mind. What has happened to her? But now it's becoming more real and it's very difficult. How can we be praying and supporting you leading up to the trial? Just that uh, we get a justice for her. We are praying for justice for sure. Yes, justice is very important now. And I want to continue pursuing this uh, illegal work I have. I think I will never stop. This I will never stop. And we, this will, is... we will keep talking about it. Yes. Um, I keep accidentally cutting you off because I'm having neurological things. <laughs> no. no. But part of it's the truck outside. Um, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate that we're on this trajectory because I see it changing people's lives in in, in private, isolated circumstances where people are cut off from most communications, but because we have groups producing public media and community resourcing for people who otherwise are totally cut off from those things, what we get to see is that people who have experienced terrible violence, because they have been cut off from the conversation about what matters to them, they can't regain their functions. But as soon as they notice that there are conversations for them and about them, yeah. and like this is going on in people's lives, and so many people have been silenced about it, they regain physical recovery functions so fast and so like unexpectedly, like nobody realizes 
how quickly people can restore neurological function. Who they, they can do amazing rehab that wasn't possible at all before because they feel, they sense, they hear, they witness the presence of a community that cares about all of us being safe and respected, which is yeah. not what many, many people have ever experienced. They have not been safe and respected, but they're supposed to pretend that they feel safe and respected. And it's not possible for them. So they disappear. Nobody yeah. knows who they are. And so you bringing this conversation to us and Bianca's energy being present with us really blesses us. Yes. And I am also grateful to you that uh, you uh, that we were able to get in touch initially. And <laughs> I am able to bring this to the public somehow. I was experiencing so much um, extreme neurological injury. It is so murky and jagged edges how we first got into conversation with one another. Like I've gone back and I've looked at it a few times, but it's sort of once once there are very severe neurological injuries, even once you remember something, you kind of can have to go back and remember it again and again until yeah. it's more fully repaired. And so so that's all murky for me. But it I mean, it feels miraculous because when I was reaching out to people at that time. And when you and I ended up in contact, I did not know. I, I think we talked about this before. I didn't know. I did, yeah. I'm not going to. And to, to discover through meeting you to record over this time, like, I mean, every couple of months or something, we, we've been talking or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, to realize that so much of this story is so inherently relevant and important to understand for the stuff that was happening to me through the years that you're talking about the stuff that was happening to me why yes. you and bianca were experiencing the things you were experiencing that's i'm I, I have a lot of shocked feelings about that but that's very common when survivors finally get to compare notes we find out what are the systems that were active between us where we didn't know one another yet, but yeah. we were experiencing the result of these, you know, population controls being applied and policies being set in place and right. stuff like that. So I'm learning so much about what was going on in my life because of things that are details that you're sharing about this that I, you know, I never added those details into my situation, I never had the luxury of thinking about it until I got to make the space to sit and talk and record with you. So yeah. intuitive public radio is the archaeology for us of yeah. discovering who we were previously and finding people who have been, you, you and Bianca have been community members to me since before we knew each other. Yes. Um, and that's a really profound experience to have. It, it's one of the, the reasons that we keep really striving to tell people what the tool sets we're using to make this media are, because otherwise severely disabled community members can't get near public media. It's almost impossible for them to be heard by a wider range of people. And so we're demonstrating how this is possible by us doing this. And I'm so grateful to get to participate in it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I will, um, w w if, unless you have any final comments, I've kept us on even even longer and I should go take care of myself, but I really wanted us to get through your notes. So we did, and I'm really glad that yeah. you did. Only what I will uh, w would like to say, I would like to continue recording with you. Mm -hmm. um, I have other plans, uh, you know, what I would like to bring to your radio. Great very interesting stuff and also stuff uh, after the lawsuit and everything mm. after the trial is over i i would like to bring more more stuff and i will continue this fight i am not letting this go i'm gonna continue thank you so much for working on this with us and letting us be part of it thank you very much thank you i i will reach out soon have a great day you too. Bye. Bye, Max. Bye. 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 Bye.